All righty then. <laughs> so, we're going to start with chapter 3, Ulrig. 3.3, increasing and decreasing functions in the first derivative test. Oxidation reduction. Yeah, Ulrich. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. Yeah. And I just now, every time I say Ulrich, it's like, I keep thinking of that. Deepwater Horizon. Yes. Now I'm thinking about the movie. Yes. Has that came out yet? I don't think it's out yet. Yeah, probably this week. I've already started the recording. Y'all should have caught me before I started recording. Now. I can't. I could pause it. There's a pause button. <laughs> I, actually, I saw... Hold on. No. Yes. Kate Hudson was on Jimmy like two nights ago, and they had a clip on it. It looked really good. She looked like she's really good in the movie anyway. <laughs> Determine intervals on which a function is increasing or decreasing. We want to be able to apply the first derivative test to find relative extrema of a function. Okay, so if I give you a graph, can you tell me where the graph is increasing and decreasing? Yeah, you can just look at it and say, well, it's going up here, it's going down here. Yeah, you can look at it and tell. What if I just give you the function itself? It's a little bit more difficult to find the intervals that are increasing and decreasing. Uh, so we want to look at how to do that without using uh, a graph. So we know from Math 112 that a function is increasing when any two x values, the y values are increasing. So if I have increasing x values, so x is 1, x is 5, if the y value goes from 1 to 5, it has to be going up, right? It's increasing. If increasing x values create increasing y values. However, if increasing x values create decreasing y values, that's talking about a decreasing function, okay? This is just basic nomenclature from pre-cal, okay? This is what it looks like. We have three different things that we can be. We can be decreasing, we can be constant, or we can be increasing. So only three options. Now when this happens, notice what happens to the derivative. A derivative on a decreasing function is what? What's that slope? Is it positive or negative? negative. It's negative, right, because it's going down. What about constant? Zero. It's zero, and then for increasing, it's positive. So this is an important you know, kind of effect that we get from taking a derivative. If the derivative is positive, we know that it has to be an increasing function on that interval, okay? Same way with, if it's negative, it has to be decreasing, and if it's zero, it has to be constant, okay? Here is theorem 3.5, which is the, the first derivative test, basically. If the first derivative is greater than zero for all the x's in some interval, then that guarantees that f is increasing, okay? If the derivative is less than zero, that means that the function has to be decreasing on that interval. If it's equal to zero, then f is constant, okay? This is the first derivative test. How exactly do you know what negative is? Positive or negative? Like what happens if we have like a positive? We'll do it. We'll, we'll work on that. And that, has, that comes back to when we, in pre-cal, when we have polynomials that we have to do polynomial inequalities where you have to factor it and then you have to test points, you have critical values, you know, things like that. And we'll do some of that just to make sure we're all up on how to re remember how to do it. So if we want to find the open intervals on which f of x equals x cubed minus 3x squared is increasing or decreasing, okay? So using the first derivative test, what have I got to do? It's kind of implied in the name. Take the derivative, right? So, what is the derivative of x cubed minus 3 halves x squared? Yeah. 3x over 2 or 3x. So, we need to find where it's less than 0. We need to find where it's greater than 0. We need to find where it's equal to 0. Okay, if there are these regions. So, what we're going to do is... If we set this equal to zero, this is going to give us what's called critical values. So we're going to factor a three out. Oh, we're going to fa factor out an x as well. 
that's going to leave us with x minus 1. And then we can set each one of these factors equal to 0. So we get x equals 0 and x equals 1. So these are going to be our critical values, right? Well, we do what? Because it's, it's a thing called the principle of zero products, which says that the only way to get two or three or four, anything's being multiplied together, the only way I can make that equal zero is if one of them is zero. Right? If I've got A times B times C equals zero, then either A has to be zero, B has to be zero, or C has to be zero. There's no other way to get zero by multiplication. And that's what we're doing here. So if you're multiplying things together to equal 0, either 3x equals 0 and x equals 0, or x minus 1 equals 0 and x equals 1. It's the only way to get it. So like if, like if one of those two has to. Has to. They don't both have to, but at least one of them has to. And they both can't because x can't be two different values at the same time. But you get what I'm saying. All right, so we know these are the critical values. These are the points that give us the derivative equal to 0. Right? So I know that they may be maximums, they may be minimums. Right? We have that critical point test. But what we're going to do is we're going to set up a number line with these numbers on it. Because we need to figure out what regions give us positive values, what regions give us negative values, and which regions give us zero. So we pick test points. I need a test point less than zero. Give me a number less than zero. Negative one. All right, I need a point between 0 and 1, and then a number greater than 1. All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to plug these values in to our factored form and see, do we get a negative number, do we get a positive number? Not the original function, Not the original function because I don't care about the <laughs> original function. I care about the, the uh, derivative. Right. So, I mean, you could plug it into 3x squared minus 3x. But it tends to be easier to just plug it into the factored form because we're only caring about sign. We don't care about the number itself. Okay? So if I plug in negative 1, 3 times negative 1 times negative 1 minus 1, that gives me negative 3, negative 2. That gives me a positive number. That means in this region, my derivative is positive. That means in that region, I have to be increasing. So from negative infinity to 0, I'm increasing. Does that make sense? All right, so let's try 0.5. 3 times 0.5 times 0.5 minus 1. That gives us uh, 1.5 times negative 0.5, which is a negative number. I, like I said, I don't really care what the number is. I just care about the sign. So that means from 0 to 1, I'm decreasing. And then here we've got 2, so 3 times 2, 2 minus 1, 6 times 1 is 6. Once again, I'm positive, so I'm back to increasing. And actually, we can. Just, just we can draw a good sketch because we know that it's a cubic function, which means it falls to the left and rises to the right. We know that we're increasing up to 0 and then decreasing, which means that 0 makes a maximum. We know that we're decreasing to, to, to 1 and then increasing, which means 1 creates a minimum. So now we can tell maxes and mins by looking at whether we're increasing or decreasing on either side of it. Okay. So if we wanted to graph this, One thing I would need to do is I would need to plug in the, the 0 and the 1 to find the y value. So what, what's the y value if x equals 0 in my original function? 0. So I know that 0, 0 is going to be a maximum. So it's going to come up, hit that, and turn around. Bless you. Then if I plug in 1, I get 1 minus 1 and a half. 
So I get negative 0.5. So negative 0.5. Something like that. So that's a basic graph, a basic sketch, just from that little bit of information. Now, we're fixing to do a second derivative test which lets us talk about concavity and points of inflection and things like that so we can actually describe where it changes shape from being bowl shaped up to bowl shaped down, you know, things like that. So we'll be able to actually graph a lot more definitively once we do the second derivative test. But does everybody understand what we're doing with the first derivative test? Just checking for increasing and decreasing by determining whether the second or the first derivative is positive or negative. It's not Super, good job. It's not super challenging, but it does take a little bit of practice to do it, okay? Just get in there and do it. So we did the critical numbers, set equal to zero, x equals zero and one. We do test intervals. Hey, there's the graph, and it looks a lot like the one I graphed. Went up to zero and turned around, went down to uh, negative one half, went back up. All right. So this gave us an instance of how to find the intervals on which a function is increasing and decreasing. Here are the guidelines for finding intervals. And by the way, I have all, I've, I've posted all the slides. They're under content test three uh, in Blackboard. I did that while we were sitting here talking. So that's done. Uh, so if we let f be some continuous function, and it's important for f to be continuous, uh, and, and differentiable. Uh, to find open intervals on which it's increasing or decreasing, we're going to find the critical numbers first. That's always going to be step one. We're going to use those numbers to determine test intervals on our number line. Okay? So we need, if we've got two uh, critical numbers, then I'm going to have three regions that I have to test. If I've got three, then I'm going to have four regions. You're always going to have one more region than critical numbers. Okay? So you pick a test point, uh, determine the sign of the derivative at that test point. Whatever the sign is for the test point is the sign for that entire region. Okay? How do you know how many intervals are, or how many critical numbers are there? You just solve the equation. It'll be like if you've got a, a third degree polynomial, then your first derivative will be a second degree polynomial, and a second degree polynomial has two roots. Does that make sense? So you'll have as many critical numbers as necessary. We're going to use the uh, theorem 3.5 to determine whether it's increasing or decreasing on the intervals. And then we're going to write it as negative infinity to the first one, first one to the second one, second to the third one. Right? You know how to do interval notation, making sure that you union together any of the uh, uh, sets that are both in the same one. Like with the one we did. Where is this function increasing? From negative infinity to zero, and then from one to positive infinity. So increasing is negative infinity to zero, unioned with one to infinity, and this is increasing. And decreasing is zero to one, if we want to write that in interval notation. Well, it's not increasing or decreasing at the test point. So you're always, when you're talking about increasing and decreasing, going to be using a parenthesis. You never use brackets for increasing or decreasing. Because what is it doing at zero? Is it, is it increasing at zero or is it decreasing at zero? It's not doing either. It's constant at zero. It's a zero, right? All right. Now, a strictly monotonic function is one on an interval that is either increasing or only decreasing. Monotonic means in one direction. So strictly monotonic means it is going over the entire interval, either always going up or always going down. Okay? X cubed. It's strictly monotonic because it is increasing on the entire real number line. It never... It does turn, it curves, but it never goes down, it never decreases, right? It's always increasing just a little bit. And you can do this 
And it looks constant. It's not. It's still going up just gradually. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this, what's the derivative of x cubed? OK, now let me ask you a question. Is there anywhere on 3x squared that I'll get a negative number? No, because x squared is always positive. So this tells us that the first derivative has to always be positive, which means the function is always increasing. No. Second derivative would be 6x. Right. And you see that that's going to lead us to the second derivative test because we have something called concavity, which tells us the shape of the bowl that it's creating in the curve. Notice how this bowl is kind of upside down. It's an upside down bowl, but this one over here is a upside right bowl. They have different concavities, and that's because the second derivative can be positive or negative. No. No. It is the slope of the first derivative, but remember, the tangent, the, the derivative gives us the slope of the tangent line. It doesn't give us a tangent function. You see what I'm saying? If I'm talking about this and I want to know, first derivative gives me the slope of that line, which is positive. The second derivative gives me the slope of the line that's created by taking that derivative, so it may be a polynomial as well. So I may have you know, some other line that's that, and then I have to find the slope there. It's a little bit different. <laughs> now here we've got this function. Notice that it actually does flatten out and go constant. Because we're defining it as negative x squared up till 0. And then from 0 to 1, we're calling it a constant function 0. And then x minus 1 squared after that. So this is not strictly monotonic because it does have a portion that's not increasing. Yeah, it's a piecewise function. If you take this out, right, this is just negative x squared. This is just x squared moved to the right one. Right, so. All right. So the first derivative test is going to give us a place or a way to determine maximums and minimums. Now, I talked about this just a little bit when we were graphing that. This is the, the crux and the heart of what we use the first derivative test for. It's for finding maximums and minimums. Okay. So if we let c be a critical number of some function that's continuous on an open interval, then what we're saying is if the derivative changes sign from negative to positive. So if we go from decreasing to increasing, that guarantees the existence of what? Well, what's at the bottom of the bowl? A relative minimum, right. If we go from the first derivative being positive to it being negative, what do we guarantee the existence of? A maximum at the top, OK? Where did that go? There we go. If it's positive on both sides, so if I'm going up here and then I'm going up here, what does that tell us? It tells us that there's no relative anything, right? It's just always increasing. Or if it's always de decreasing, it doesn't tell us anything. Well, it does tell us something. It tells us that there's not a maximum or a minimum there, right? It tells us that it's just a critical number. Thank you for joining us. You having a good morning? Bad? There we go. All right. 
orthopedic center. It's TOC. Yeah. Come on now. <laughs> it's where everybody works at that is a physical therapist. Didn't you know? Okay. So let's find the relative extreme on the function uh, 1 half x minus sine x on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Now, notice I don't tell you whether they're maximums, minimums. We'll determine that once we determine the uh, extrema. So let's take the derivative of fx. What's the derivative of f? What's the derivative of 1 half x? What's the derivative of negative sine? Negative, negative cosine. Okay? So I'm going to take this. That's the first derivative. So what have I got to do now? How do I find critical numbers? Set it equal to zero. <laughs> I'll tell you this. About half the time, plug it in is the right answer. So just not this time. Set it equal to zero. So we're going to move the cosine over. We get cosine x equals 1 half. <laughs> if you'd have done a little better on your trig final, you would have known how to do this. If we've got 1 half equals cosine x, we need to find all the values of x that give us cosine x equals 1 half. So we're going to use arc function. So we're looking at where does cosine give us 1 half? That's at pi over, nope. Yeah. If you do not have a unit circle, I suggest we go ahead and get us another one because you're going to need it for stuff like this. Matt's got his. I can't believe Austin doesn't have one. Exactly. <laughs> well, cosine is 1 half at pi over, it's close, it's not 6, but 3, <laughs> pi over 3. Now, that's where arc comes in, but remember, we're on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So is there anywhere else on the interval from 0 to 2 pi that gives us 1 half? Five pi over 3. Because remember, cosine is the x value, right? The x value will be positive in the first and fourth quadrants. So that's pi over 3, 5 pi over 3. Okay? So those are the two. See, was it hung as he what? Second and third quadrant, yeah, give you negative 1 half for the, for the over 3s. All right, so this gives us our critical numbers. We've got pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. So I need a test point. And remember, we're only talking about the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So I need a, something between 0 and pi over 3. Pi over 6. Between pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Pi. And between 5 pi over 3 and 2 pi? 11 pi over 6, that'll work. So we're going to go back and plug it in to right here. Okay? So we've got 1 half minus cosine of pi over 6. What's cosine of pi over 6? Root 3 over 2. 1 half minus root 3 over 2. Is that a positive number or a negative number? It's going to be a negative number, right? Because root 3 is bigger than 1. So this is going to give us a negative number. All right. What if I do 1 half minus cosine of 0? What's cosine of 0? No. Cosine of pi. I, I said it wrong. What's cosine of pi? It's okay, class is just whenever. <laughs> B 
But you needed the you needed the lesson, so you're okay. Don't worry about it. So, cosine of pi is negative one. So what's one half minus negative one? Is that positive or negative? That's positive. And then we do eleven pi over six. What's uh, it's also root three over two, which is going to be a negative number. Decreasing to a maximum, decreasing to a minimum. This goes down, this goes up, this goes up, this goes down. So that means here we have a minimum, here we have a maximum. Now we want to find the actual point, so we need to plug pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3 into the original function to get the y value, right? We've got the x value, we need the y value. So if I plug in pi over 3, I get 1 half pi over 3 minus sine of pi over 3. So what's the sine of pi over 3? Root 3 over 2. So we've got pi over 6 minus root 3 over 2. If we do 5 pi over 3, Yeah, we're going back to the original equation to find the y value. So that's going to give us 5 pi over 6. And what's sine of 5 pi over 3? Negative root 3 over 2. So, so our two extrema occur at pi over 3, pi over 6 minus root 3 over 2, and 5 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6 plus root 3 over 2. Why? I should have failed you. <laughs> now, what you need to do is, when you have problems like this, go back, brush up, work on your trig, get caught back up. I know you've been working on homework. Have you? Did you slide last week? You've been working on your stuff. You've been doing what you're supposed to be doing. Did you slide last week? Did you do math last week? Okay. Just making sure. All right, so here's what the graph looks like. Now notice, and this will probably be the case for your homework as well, they didn't ask you to give the value of the maximum or minimum. They just asked you to find where it was at. I took it to the next step to verify that we could get the actual point, but they most of the time are not going to ask you for that. If that makes you feel any better basically, and to tell whether it's a maximum or minimum. Well, it's not bad to do it the other way. Either. It's not bad to plug it in and get a number, but you most likely want to use your calculator and get a decimal approximation. So. Yeah, and the, you'll see that sometimes I tell you more than you need to know for the homework, but that's okay. It's better to know too much than to not know enough, right? Yes, it is. Trust me. All right, so Deepwater Horizon 3.4, concavity in the second derivative test. So we want to determine the intervals on which a function is concave up or concave down. So when we talk about concavity, that's what we're talking about. If something is concave up, that means it's bowl-shaped. If it's concave down, then it's upside-down bowl-shaped. Okay? We want to find points of inflection. A point of inflection is where something changes from bowl shaped down to bowl shape up. The point where it changes concavity is called the point of inflection. And we're going to apply the second derivative test to find relative extreme of a function. No. No. Inflection just means changing concavity. That's it. Doesn't have to do that 
it doesn't have to do it anywhere in particular. And generally, it's not going to happen on a on an axis unless you just happen to have a beautiful function, you know, a nice one that doesn't have a bunch of crap added to it. All right, so if we let f be differentiable on an open interval, then the graph is concave up when the uh, first derivative is increasing on the interval and concave downward on i when the first derivative is decreasing on the interval. No, not necessarily a pretty function. This can be any any function f. If the first derivative is increasing, then that means that it's going to be concave up, concave, you know. Hold on. Now, it's really important to recognize the nomenclature here and don't get confused by what it says. Because I, I just had a brain bleed for a second. It's concave up when the first derivative is increasing, not when the first derivative is positive. Okay, but when the first derivative is increasing. You see the difference in those two words? We just did the first derivative being positive or negative to determine whether the function was increasing or decreasing. Now we're going to have to take the second derivative and determine whether the second derivative is positive or negative to determine whether the first derivative is increasing or decreasing. you all see what I'm saying? All right. So you've got a function f. If f is positive, no. If f prime is positive, then f is increasing. Yes, that's what we just did. If f prime is negative, then f is decreasing. Right? That's what we just did. That was the first derivative test, right? The second derivative test says that if f prime is increasing, increasing, then we're concave up. If f prime is decreasing, then we're concave down. But for f prime to be increasing, notice that if f is increasing, then f prime is positive. So if f prime is increasing, f double prime has to be positive. And if f prime is decreasing, then f double prime has to be negative. That's where the second derivative comes in. So if it, is if, it, if it's positive, it's increasing. So. But what, what I'm saying is if a function is increasing, its derivative has to be positive. Right. Okay. If a function, f prime, is increasing, then its derivative, f double prime, has to be positive. Okay? Did everybody see it? Decreasing means that its derivative has to be positive or negative. I mean, when you take the derivative of the first derivative, you get the second derivative. If it's positive, then it has to be positive. No, not at all. Because we saw that when we did x squared. Right? If we had, if we have 3x, or if we've got x cubed, take the derivative, you get 3x squared. That's always going to be positive. But if you take the second derivative, you get 6x. That's negative for all negative values of x and positive for all values of positive x. So the, the positive and negative of the function itself does not dictate the positive or negative of its derivative or the second derivative. It doesn't. No, I didn't. I said for f prime to be increasing, the second derivative has to be positive. Oh, okay. That's the only stipulation. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the derivative itself or the uh, function itself. Okay? Everybody have a vague understanding now? All right. So here we'll let's look at this. Notice here this picture is concave upward on the entire picture, right? It's bowl-shaped 
the bowl can hold water, so it's concave up. But notice I have portions where the derivative is decreasing and increasing. So even though the second derivative is positive everywhere, the first derivative has portions that are negative and positive. Correct. Even if the first derivative is Correct. I mean, I'm looking at the, looking at the graph and understanding how that's possible. Because, I mean, a bowl goes down and then it comes up on other Right. Side. So there has to be portions that are increasing and decreasing, even though the entire thing is concave up. But how tell just from eating half the graph? No. That's what the second derivative test is going to do. All right, so here's a picture of one going down that has portions that are positive and portions that are negative. This is logical, right? We know that any bowl has to be increasing and decreasing on either side of it. So. But the bowl, if the bowl is increasing on the left side and decreasing on the right side, I think it needs to go straight down. Right? Yeah, like this one. This one. Like that. Yeah. So whenever you do the same thing we did on test one, if it's it has to be decreasing first and then increasing. Correct. Correct. But you'll see that we don't always have full bowls. We could have like with x cubed. What does x cubed look like? Looks like this, right? So it switches over. Here it's concave down, but here it's concave up. Right. But when we do this, we'll see that on this interval from negative infinity to whatever this is, zero, that all of the first derivatives are positive because it's an increasing function, but also the second derivatives are negative because it's concave down. Which makes sense because if we do x cubed, the first derivative is 3x squared, which is always positive. The second derivative is 6x, which is negative any time that we have a negative x. of the first derivative. Okay. So let's look at this. If we take the first derivative of one third x cubed minus x, so this is the graph of one third x cubed minus x. Notice that it's concave down on the open interval from negative infinity to zero. Right? There's your bowl shape. And we can see that if we take the first derivative, x squared minus 1 always is negative on that interval. Not negative, decreasing, sorry. Second derivative is always negative. Here is the first derivative. This will give you kind of an idea Austin, because here I'm graphing, this is the derivative, or this is the function, but this is the derivative of that function. So notice it has nothing to do with that tangent line or anything. It's a separate function in and of itself. And we can see that if we look at zero, or negative infinity to zero, it's always decreasing. So if it's decreasing here, if the derivative is decreasing, then the function has to be concave down. From 0 to infinity, the first derivative is increasing, which means we have to be concave up in the original function. The bottom is the derivative. That's exactly what you're Correct. Which makes sense because if you take a third degree polynomial and take the derivative, you're going to get a second degree polynomial, right? Second degree polynomial is a parabola. No, you wouldn't graph them together. You strictly want to look at them separately. If I don't even know anything about this graph, I can look at this one. It's the first derivative. And I can say, well, the first derivative is, okay, we can do a couple of things here. 
it's always decreasing from negative infinity to zero, right? So a decreasing derivative means concave down. It's increasing here, which means concave up. Not yet. But yes, anywhere we switch from decreasing to increasing, when, when we did the first derivative test, somewhere from increasing to decreasing gave us a, ma a relative max or a min, right? Now we're talking about changing concavity. If we go from concave up to concave down, it has to be a point of inflection. So just because you have a relative max or a relative minimum, that's an inflection. Wrong. It has to happen there. Yes. A point of inflection has to happen anywhere there's a relative minimum or maximum on the first derivative. It's a weird way of saying it, but yes, it does have to happen. So let's look at the test for concavity. Did you get it? All right. So the second derivative, when it's greater than zero, the second derivative, then it's concave up. When the second derivative is less than zero, it's concave down. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to first find all the values where the second derivative equals zero. So now we're talking about kind of second derivative critical numbers, okay? And that's going to set up a test intervals, basically the first derivative test using the second derivative. It's the same thing. We're going to do the exact same process. So let's look at this one and determine where is it concave up and concave down. So step one is to find the derivative, right? So let's rewrite this as 6 times x squared plus 3 to the negative 1. So I don't have to use uh, quotient rule. We'll just use chain rule. right? So first derivative, negative 6, x squared plus 3 to the negative 2 times 2x. That's going to give us negative 12x times x squared plus 3 to the negative 2. Everybody go with that? All right, so now we've got the first derivative. To find concavity, we've got to have the second derivative. So we need to take the derivative of that. What rule are we going to have to use for this? No? What? Product rule, right? Because it's negative 12x times x squared plus 3 to the negative 2. So this is product rule. So we do first times the derivative of the second. So negative 2x squared plus 3 to the negative 3 times 2x. Plus second times the derivative of the first. Maybe. Who knows? I can do algebra, so. So when we multiply this out, we get 2, 2 is 4, is positive 48x squared times x squared plus 3 to the negative 3 minus 12 times x squared plus 3 to the negative 2. So we're going to factor out an x squared plus 3 to what? We always use the what? The smallest number. Which one's smaller? Negative 3. And that's going to leave us with 48x squared minus 12, negative 2 minus negative 3 is 1, so times x squared plus 3 to the first power. So that's going to be 48x squared minus 12x squared minus 36 over x squared plus 3 cubed. Calculus was easy. Everybody do it. So now I've got to find. You're right. It, the, outer, the, the calculus part of this was not difficult, right? Load or first times derivative of the second plus second times derivative of the first. That's easy. It's the 
getting from there to here. Because I've got to set this equal to zero, right? So if I set this equal to zero, what am I really doing? Bottoms are relevant, right? If I set it equal to zero, all I care is that the numerator is equal to zero. So I just set 48x squared minus, well, let's do the math, right? 36x squared minus 36 equals zero. Factor out the 36. We get x squared minus 1 equals zero. What? Where? Where did I get lost? Oh, oh, no. All right. okay. I just divided both sides by 36. Now, he the 48X, uh, minus the 12X. Yeah, like terms. I was trying to figure out what happened, but... Like terms. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> 48X squared minus 12X squared is 36X squared minus 36. And then divide both sides by 36. You get X squared minus 1. Factor that as X plus 1, X minus 1. So you get X equals negative 1 and x equals 1. Well, that's just part 1. The critical second derivative numbers, yes. Unlimited. It's not timed. They open at 8 a.m. 7. Yes. <laughs> All right, so this gives us our critical numbers. So we've got negative 1 and 1. So how many intervals does that give us? 1, 2, 3, right? So I need a number less than negative 1. How about negative 2? And between negative 1 and 1, 0, bigger than 1, 2. So what we've got to do is we've got to plug these test points where? back into the second derivative. Okay? Which is not too bad because notice that all of the x's are squared. So negative numbers are going to get eaten. Right? So if I plug in negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4. 4 times 48 minus 12 times 4 minus 36. Well, is that a positive or negative number? It's going to be a positive number, right? But this, the x is still squared. So negative 2 squared is still positive 4. 4 plus 3 is 7. 7 cubed is still a positive number. I mean, you can rewrite it as 36x squared minus 36. all over x squared plus 3 cubed. So that means that's positive. But if I plug in 0, I get 0 minus 36. So I get a negative number on top over a positive number. So I get a negative. But if I plug in 2, it's the exact same thing as negative 2, right? Because all those x's are squared. So I know I get a positive. So. What interval gives us concave up? One to infinity. So negative infinity to negative one, union with one to infinity. And where do we have concave down? From negative one to one. What do you mean? No, not necessarily. No, you can't just say, oh, I got the first one, just bounce them. Because sometimes you go up, up, okay. right? 90% of the time, yes. But that 10% may show up on the test. So, <laughs> right? So what you're saying is that 10% you said that, you know, it doesn't have a, are going to be on problem. It's like 80% of the test. <laughs> This is what the graph looks like. So notice, from negative infinity to negative 1, I am concave up, right? This is the side of a bowl that's up. 
at negative one, I switch to concave down, and then at positive one, I switch again back to concave up. It is. This is not bad. It's not. It's, once again, it's going to be the algebra that's the most difficult part of this. But the math is not bad as long as you know how to derive. As long as you can take derivatives, you're okay. That's why we learn them first. Yeah. Well, you you may see them. Um, we do it when we do um, integration at infinity. We're gonna. It, it's not that bad. You, it's no. Most of most of the limits that you do from here on out are plug-in limits, where you just plug in as x approaches two, just plug two in. It'll be the integration test. Mm. Is that the test? Yeah. And is it bad? Bad? No, it's just. Well, some of it is, and it a lot of it is. Uh, there's something we have to do called substitute. There's different rules that we have to do, and there are like three or four that you have to have in your head. The little tricks, you know. So I want you to be able to study them and look at them and look at your notes and, and be able to get used to using all these different tricks. Because a lot of times to me, when you when you first learn how to do integration, it's just so much at one time. Because basically it's doing derivatives backwards, which is, I mean, it sounds rough. It's not as bad as it sounds, but uh, some of the tricks, until you get used to doing them, they're they're complicated. So I, that was that's going to be your take-home test, is integration. So. Notice that the function that was given is continuous on the entire real number line. If there are x values where the function is not continuous, then we have to use these values along with those critical numbers that we found uh, to form our test intervals. Okay, So we may have undefined points that we need to use as critical numbers as well. Critical numbers are not just going to be wherever the second derivative equals 0. It will also be undefined points uh, on the uh, function. Yeah, let me show you an example. Say I've got an asymptote here. It's undefined at that asymptote, right? So I'm not going to get a critical number per se. But if I test it on either side of that asymptote, I'll see that I'm concave down here and concave up here. So I have to. Yes. It's not as important for the first derivative. Why? Because it doesn't matter. Well, we're looking for maximums and minimums, and they can't occur at an asymptote. Because there's nothing there. Right. But we can talk about concavity there. Okay? Because what happens if, if I did the first derivative test on this? Then I would get that it's increasing up to that point. And then it's increasing from that point. It doesn't really tell us anything, right? Or even if it were increasing and then decreasing. That would give us a faulty assumption that there's a maximum there, which there's truly not because it goes to infinity. So we don't worry about it with the first derivative test. All right. So if the tangent line of the graph exists at a point where the concavity changes, that point is a point of inflection. Okay. It could look like this, could be horizontal, could be vertical, but it is going to be there. We're going to have a value. We go from concave up to concave down, concave down to concave up. Uh, if there's change, it's a point of inflection. If it They are both possibly cubic functions, right. but just because it's a cubic function doesn't mean that it's going to be concave upward to concave down. No. 
and that's probably not a cubic function. That's probably some other function, but. All right, so here's the strict definition of a point of inflection. We're going to let f be a function that's continuous on some open interval, and we're going to let c be a point in that interval. So if the graph has tangent line at the point c, f of c, then that's a point of inflection. Okay? And that's going to be where the concavity changes from up to downward. Now, notice this little theorem 3.8. If this point is a point of inflection, then that means that either the second derivative is zero or uh, the second derivative doesn't exist there. Okay? I don't care. I'm not saying it's important to recognize the order that we're saying this in. If we have a point of inflection, then it is necessary that the second derivative is either zero or undefined. So if it's undefined, like, so if there's like an asymptote on the derivative, mm -hmm. then that's going to be, that would also be a point of inflection on the derivative, correct? No. Now that's, the, and this is the point I'm trying to make. We're reading it from here to there. We're not reading it from there to here. The second derivative being zero or undefined does not Necessi necessitate the existence of a point of inflection. But a point of inflection, we would say that the maximum amount of force has to go. On the first derivative, yes. Mm -hmm. But, like I said, just because the, the second derivative is equal to zero or undefined does not mean that there is a point of inflection there. It just means there's a possible point of inflection that we have to check. Okay? So if I ask you for the point of inflections, the first thing you do, take the second derivative, find those critical numbers, find the places where it's undefined. Once you've found those values, you have to test and see, is it concave up and concave down? Concave down, concave up. Do they switch concavity? And if they do switch concavity, then it's a point of inflection. If they don't switch concavity, it's not a point of inflection. Okay? So, let's determine the points of inflection and discuss the concavity of the graph of x to the fourth minus 4x cubed. So, step one. What's the first derivative? Alright. Now let's take the second derivative. Okay. Is there anywhere that's undefined? No. So I don't have to worry about that. So I set it equal to zero. So let's pull a 12x out. I get x equals zero and x equals two. These are our possible points of inflection. Right, is it a guarantee that they're points of inflection? Are those they're second derivative critical numbers. Yes. They are. I mean, I don't know that we strictly always call them critical numbers, but that's what they are. We do the same process to find them that we did the, the critical numbers for the first derivative. So we, we've shown that here is where the second derivative equals zero. Does that guarantee the existence of points of inflection? No, it doesn't. It just guarantees that there's something going on there. Now, how do we determine whether there are points of inflection or not? We have to check the concavity, right? We have to determine whether they're positive or negative and see what happens at those points. So we've got zero and we've got two. So give me a number less than zero. A number between zero and two and a number bigger than two. We're going to plug this into the, the factored form of the second derivative because that's where it's easiest to do it at here. You can do it here, but it tends to be easier to do it into the factored form. Well, remember, we're only caring about the sign, right? So if I plug in negative 1, 12 times negative 1 is negative 12. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. A negative times a negative is positive. Now, if I plug in 1, I get... 12 times 1 is 12. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Gives us a negative number. So I plug in 375. 
12 times 375 is a positive number. 375 minus 2 is a positive number. Positive times a positive is positive. I did. So this means that we are concave up here and then concave down. I don't know why I went back up. Here we are concave down to concave up. Right, so that guarantees points of inflection. Now, when we did maximum minimums before, we didn't care about the y value. With points of inflection, it is a point of inflection. So I really do need to define it as a point. So I've got the x values, right? The x values are 0 and 2. So how do I find the y values? Yes, you plug it back into the original function because that's where it's going to be inflecting, right? In the original function. So we got 0, 0, and then. 2 to the 4th is 16 minus 16. So those are going to be the two points of inflection. So is that all you need to be able to graph that function? Well, we know points of inflection, but if we did the first derivative test, we could find the maximums and minimums. points of inflection. The other things that we could find are x and y intercepts. To graph a, a, a good graph, yeah, you'd want, you'd want to find the x and y intercepts. But the x, the y intercept is easy because it's just the origin, right? We already figured that out. We would also have to, to solve the original equation for 0 to, to find the uh, x intercepts, which is not hard, but 0 and 4. You set the function equal to zero. You set the function equal to zero for x. Okay. Which you would just factor in x cubed out. You'd get x cubed times x minus four. That gives you x equals zero. X equals four. We already knew the, the one at zero. So. And that's what section six is applying all of this stuff and graphing. Well. You feel like that. Work on the homework and then come back and tell me whether it's super easy. Well, I mean, I mean, the concepts are super easy. It's going to take, it's going to take a lot of time, but I mean, you're not going to do that. That's, and th that's what this is. This is time consuming. Yeah. I mean, it's like running a mile. It's not super hard. It takes an hour. Running a mile is hard. <laughs> uh, what who, who here runs? actively runs not like from like like horrors or you know <laughs> lions but everybody runs from a lion I run to the donut shop. <laughs> I'm just curious because uh, like, count? well I mean if you run, I, run down I, I would figure you'd do a little bit more than that to consider yourself a runner but well, like a oh you just do like cardio before you work out no. oh no that don't count you're not a runner Sometimes I run a mile. Do you do it on a treadmill? Elliptical. That's not even running. <laughs> Don't talk to me. Who here runs outside recreationally? Not not necessarily just for exercise, but for recreation. Okay. My cousin does that. She runs like Who runs for recreation? A lot of people run for fun. My cousin runs like those 20K marathons. They're running for fun. So I plan on, you know, I've run a 5K now, and so I'm, I've got the bug. I'm ready to go. But next year, I'm going to do the, uh, the what? What is that? I would love to do the That would be awesome. Look it up. Okay, it's going to be at the end of October. You might just go sign up. But it's a 10-mile run through the woods. It has a bunch of different obstacles. Stuff like that. That's awesome. 10 miles? No, I don't want to do 10 miles. That's too much right now. Oh, okay, maybe. It's Ten miles. <laughs> okay, that that could be cool. Uh, no. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, 
hard pass, I'm out. <laughs> no, I'm not running through a taser field. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do that. No. I can't pull my big self up that thing. I don't care. Yeah, but that still implies that I can climb up and I have no upper body strength. That's what I'm saying. I can't do that. No, I'm out. I'm out. There's tasers in a warp wall. I can't do it. Well, there's another reason not to do it. It's in Fulaski. Huh? I'm what? It's okay. That's, that's an awful thing to say. You're right, but it's awful. But I'm going to do a, the sprint triathlon in Huntsville next year. That already sounds awful. I don't want to do burpees either. God. Now, I was, the, the reason this got started, you know, uh, I had I had my surgery in December, so I'm coming up on a year. A guy posted in one of the forums that he just finished, and he showed a picture of him finishing the uh, uh, Ironman Augusta race, and he's 33 months out. So I'm like, okay, so my goal now is to beat 33 months to, to run, you know, a, a real triathlon as opposed to a sprint. I don't think that one was a full one because it, it, it's a half, it was a half marathon. It was only 52-mile bike and 1.2-mile. Uh, I think it's like a half Ironman, really. So I don't want to do a full. Who wants? Okay. A full Ironman is awful. Yeah, it's 100, 104 mile, a full marathon. Yeah, yeah. So, I think that I think that his I think that was a half Ironman. Right? That's what I'm saying. I can't even imagine having to run a marathon. I have no desire to run a marathon. That's just too far. No, you you swim first, then bike, then run. Well, you you. You train. You have to train for it. Swimming two and a half miles in the open ocean, then biking a hundred miles, and then having to run twenty-six—that would be awful. Well, that's why it's called an Ironman triathlon, right? I might could do it in a month. All right, let's get back on topic so I can so we can finish this section. They did that. They did that to me in class yesterday. We were, for the first 20 minutes, we didn't talk about anything but food. It was awful. I've got to finish this section. That soup is chicken gnocchi. Chicken gnocchi. Gnocchi. G n o c c i. Okay. Chicken gnocchi. And this is what we got started talking yesterday about chicken gnocchi. I made a big batch of it a couple of months ago, and I froze it. Deliciousness. And. Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you something. Chicken gnocchi does not reconstitute. Uh, the the soup is good. The the vegetables, the chicken is fine. Gnocchi, not designed to be frozen and, and thawed out. It's just potato dumplings, and they the texture becomes like no, it's it's like yeah, it's grainy. That's a good way of putting it. It's kind of grainy. It's like really bad dumplings, you know. I know everybody's had that one person that's like, you just got to try my chicken dumplings, and you bite into a dumpling, and it's like, what is this? This is not even done. But it's kind of like that, But they're, and they're chewy and grainy, and they're not good, and I had to throw a whole bowl of gnocchi away, and it hurt my heart. But math. Y'all are getting me started. Shut up. Shut up, Austin. Here we go. Here's, a, here's our graph. We got our point of inflection. Our point of inflection down here, notice that it changes from concave down to concave up. And that point is the point of inflection. That's where it happens at. Kind of does. Now, this is what I was saying. The converse of theory, uh, theorem 3.8 is not generally true 
That is, it's possible to have a second derivative of b0 and not have a point of inflection. x to the fourth is a good, a good way of seeing this. Because what happens if I take the uh, second derivative of x to the fourth? I get a quadratic, right? A quadratic is always positive, right? Because it's going to be, it's not, not a quadratic, but a, a quadratic monomial is always going to be positive. So it goes from concave down, concave up, but there's, concave up in both intervals. Concave up, concave up. It goes from decreasing to increasing, but it's still concave up everywhere on the interval, therefore there's no point of inflection. It just chills out. What are y'all looking at? Stop it. It's math. Jordan pulls up this Hillary scandal picture, and he's looking, he's like, I can't read it. <laughs> All right, second derivative test. It is. <laughs> Everybody's hearing all of this. Hey, do, you watch, do you watch Mike and Mike in the morning? No. Yes. But you know what it is? Yes. Yesterday, he ate uh, ghost pepper. Uh, yeah. Hamburgers. Yes. Wait, hamburgers? He, it was hamburgers laced with ghost yeah. pepper. Yes. Laced. And it was the funniest thing ever. I want one. Is it like I just want a hamburger. Now, have, has anybody seen the new the bag of uh, roulette Doritos? I need somebody to test them out and see how hot the the roulette chips are. This is it's called roulette, and it's basically a bag of regular Doritos with like some really super hot ones thrown in there. So you're just eating your chips, and it's like, oh, these are good. This is just Doritos. Oh crap! And I want a bag of them, but I <laughs> I'm just kind of curious as to how hot the hot one is. Yeah, but I'm not stupid, so I'm not going to do that. It's one chip. I want to try it. I want to try Go it. Go right ahead. Can you bring it to class? I'll video it for the... No, but Mike, I was going to look yesterday. His mouth was so on fire. He just sat with a piece of bread in his mouth. He wasn't eating it. Right. He just sat there with a piece of bread. His face completely red. He had milk, but the milk didn't have I, I, saw, I saw this video one time of this guy eating. I don't even, it, it, it wasn't a guy, it was his girl, it was his wife. And they were, she, she ate something, and she literally just started drooling. I mean, it was just, she just couldn't, I mean, she was just saliva everywhere. She was just, Whoa! Oh, no, no. Because people, I heard that people will pick them up with gloves on and it'll eat through the gloves. Huh. It's ridiculous. How does that not ruin your stomach? It does, it ruins your stomach. <laughs>
Let's do math. We got 15 minutes. We can finish this section. <laughs> All right, here's the second derivative test. What the second derivative test actually says is that if we've got a function and the first derivative is equal to zero and the second derivative exists, then if the second derivative is greater than zero, then it's a minimum. If the second derivative is less than zero, then it's a maximum. Okay? So this is a way to use the second derivative to find the relative minimum and maximum. Because we're talking about the second derivative, not the first derivative. Uh, still, that doesn't make any sense. Well, no, think about if we are uh, a positive quadratic, right? It's a positive function. Does it have a maximum or minimum? It has a minimum. It's positive, but it has a minimum. A negative quadratic looks like this. Has a maximum, even though it's negative. I mean, things like that happen. Don't get super confused, okay? Right. Well, you know, I was doing uh, the Egyptian stuff for n behavior, you know, where it's like if it's a cube, a cubic looks like that, and then a, a negative cubic looks like that, and then you've got negatives, and, you know, so. All right, back to this. I don't know what to say. Anyway, let's do it. All right, find the extrema of f of x equals negative 3x to the fifth plus 5x cubed. I can do this with the first derivative test. It's easy, we've done it. Now I want to do it with the second derivative test, okay? So let's first find the first derivative. What's the first derivative? All right. Now what's the second derivative? Okay. So I'm going to set the second derivative equal to zero. So we get 30x equals 0 and negative 2x squared plus 1 equals 0. Rewrite it, rationalizing it. Wait, what? Let's rationalize the denominator. Multiply top and bottom by root 2. So I need a number less than negative root 2 over 2. How about negative 5? A number between negative root 2 over 2 and 0. Give me a decimal approximation of root 2 over 2.
0.7. So we need a number less than negative 0.7, so negative 0.5, and then positive 0.5, and then say 5. Bunch of fives. So if I plug in negative 5 into my factored form, I get negative 5 times 30 is a negative number. Negative 5 squared is positive times negative 2 plus 1 is going to give me a negative number. So that's positive. Negative half gives me a negative number. Negative half squared is a quarter. A quarter times negative 2 is negative half plus 1 is negative, which is plus 0.5 gives us positive times a negative, which is a negative, and then 5 gives us positive and positive, no, negative. Which is negative. This one. It has to be in the second derivative. Yeah. Yes. So we have a point of inflection here. So we're concave up concave down. Here we've got concave up and we still have concave up. Here we have concave down and concave down. A graph of what? Yeah, I'll show it to you in just a second. Oh, you know what? Because <laughs> I didn't do the, I didn't do the second derivative test on it. I just did the second derivative. All right, let's go back so that we understand what we're doing. We've got to find the values where the first derivative equals zero. Okay? And we're going to plug those values in to the second derivative, not the first derivative. So let me skip this. If we set the first derivative equal to zero, factor out the negative 15, we get x squared times negative x squared plus 1 equals 0. So we get x equals 0, x equals plus or minus 1. Those are the critical numbers, right, of the first derivative. So now we're going to look at the sign of the second derivative at those points. Okay? Just that point. I did way more than was necessary. Yeah, we found the second derivative. Not for this problem. So we're going to plug these numbers in to the second derivative. So we got f double prime of 0, f double prime of 1, f double prime of negative 1. So if we plug in 0, we get 0. Plug in 1, we get negative 60 plus 30, negative 30. Plug in negative 1, we get 90. So since this is positive, this is negative, and this is 0, we have three different situations. Because negative 1 times negative 60 is positive 60. 
Oh, minus 30. Ah. Be 30. I was, yeah, I was with you. I was, hey, I was, I bought it. <laughs> but it's still positive, right? So our rule tells us that if the second derivative is positive, what do we have? A minimum. If something is negative, then it's a maximum. And what does it tell us when it equals zero? No, it tells us nothing. It tells us the test fails, and we would have to use the first derivative test to determine it. But when we did it, we determined that it was a point of inflection, and point of inflections don't generally tend to create maximums or minimums. Well, if I switch from concave up to concave down, is there any way for that to be a max or a min? No. It's not a squatter. Test fails at zero. At just at zero. Just at zero. But since it was positive at negative one, that's a minimum. Since it was negative at positive one, that's a maximum. Yes. You'd have to have a maximum in there somewhere. Well, I mean, if that zero in the middle were actually maximum, then you could have minimums on either value, on either side. Yeah. But that would be, there would be no points of inflection, which means that wouldn't be possible. Because that, then it would have to swap. Like twice. There would be a maximum. You can have point of inflection without having a maximum or minimum, and vice versa. So this is what the graph looks like. So notice at zero. Point of inflection, but no max or min. So when do you have to learn how to grab that? We'll be doing that next week. That's three six, yeah. I think that's three six. Huh? Well, no. I mean, because we just found the maximum, the minimum, and the point of inflection there. How do you get stuff from point? Yeah. Well, I can find the x-intercepts. I can find the y-intercept. And then I know that it's a fifth root, so it's going to be rising to the left, falling to the right, so I can just connect all the dots. So wait, is it odd, odd functions? Or, either, or fall to the left? Or? Yeah, it's odd. How do you know if it's... See this negative? Yes. Normally, odd functions fall to the left and rise to the right. But it's negative, so it flips it. All right. So work on the homework. If you've got any questions, send me a message. Bring any questions to class. We're behind, so we won't be doing review on Monday like I think it says. We're not going to be doing it? Well, no, because we haven't finished the stuff yet. So we can't do review until we finish the material. We'll do a review on Thursday. No, no, no. The, the test will get pushed back. Homework will get pushed back, too. Yes. Mm-hmm.